Good afternoon to everyone and welcome to Presidential Debates in Historical Perspective, part of the American Historical Association's History Behind the Headlines series. I'm Jeremy Young, Communications and Marketing Manager at the AHA. Presidential Debates in Historical Perspective is part of Virtual AHA, a series of online opportunities to bring together communities of historians, build professional relationships, discuss scholarship, and engage in professional and career development. Thank you to the following sponsors for their generous support of today's presentation the National Endowment for the Humanities, Stanton Foundation, and the History. The American Hist Historical Association is a member-supported organization. If you'd like to become a member and support this type of content, membership links are located in the chat on Zoom, the comments on Facebook Live, or will be very shortly. Today's presentation will begin with about 45 minutes of moderated discussion, after which the panelists will respond to audience questions. As you listen, feel free to post questions in the Q&A section on Zoom or in the comments on Facebook Live. AHA staff members will collect the questions and the panel chair will read selected questions to the panelists. A recording of this presentation will be available on the AHA's YouTube channel within a week. It is an honor now to introduce today's panel chair. Joanne B. Freeman is the class of 1954 professor of American history and of American studies at Yale University. Her research and teaching center on early American politics and political culture with a particular focus on political violence. A fellow of the Society of American Historians, Freeman has won fellowships from, among others, the American Council of Learned Societies, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers, the Dirksen Congressional Research Center, the American Historical Association, and the Library of Congress. Her book, Affairs of Honor, National Politics in the New Republic, won the Best Book Award from the Society of Historians of the, American, the Early American Republic. Her most recent book, The Field of Blood, Violence in Congress and the Road to Civil War, explores physical violence in the U.S. Congress between 1830 and the Civil War, and what it suggests about the institution of Congress, the nature of American sectionalism, the challenges of a young nation's developing democracy, and the longstanding roots of the Civil War. Welcome, Professor Freeman. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here, and it's my particular pleasure to continue with the introductions uh, and introduce the three people who are going to be joining us on the panel today. Um, first, Catherine Kramer Brunel uh, is Associate Professor of History at Purdue University and an editor of Made by History at the Washington Post. Her research and teaching focus on the intersections between media, politics, and popular culture with a particular emphasis on the American presidency. Her first book, Showbiz Politics, Hollywood in American Political Life, examines the institutionalization of entertainment styles and structures in American politics and the rise of the celebrity presidency. She's now working on a new book project on the political history of cable television. Dr. Peniel Joseph joined the University of Texas at Austin in 2015 as founding director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. Prior to joining UT, uh, Dr. Joseph was a professor at Tufts University in Medford, Massachusetts, where he also founded the school's Center for the Study of Race and Democracy to promote research focused on issues of race and democracy. His career focus has been on what he describes as black power studies, which encompasses interdisciplinary fields such as African studies, law and society, women's and ethnic studies, and political science. Newton and Minow is senior counsel to the law firm of Sydney Austin LLP, where he was a managing partner for more than 25 years. His long and storied career includes service as law clerk to Chief Justice Fred M. Vinson of the US Supreme Court and as assistant counsel to Illinois Governor Adlai E. Stevenson. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy appointed him chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, where he served until 1963. In addition, Mr. Minow is a former chairman of the Rand Corporation, trustee emeritus of the Mayo Clinic, a life trustee of Northwestern University and the University of Notre Dame, a former trustee and chairman of the Carnegie Foundation, a founder and later chairman of PBS. He's a member of the Commission on Presidential Debates and related to what we're talking about here, he has actually been involved in every presidential debate from 1960 to the present time. In 2016, President Barack Obama presented Mr. Minow with our nation's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Now, um, this 
discussion, this panel that we're having today is particularly well-timed, not just because on Tuesday, we're going to be seeing the first presidential debate, but also, and I will confess this is entirely by coincidence, today happens to be the 60th anniversary of the first Kennedy-Nixon debate. So the first televised presidential debate. Accidental, I think a little bit providential. And I think for that very reason, it maybe makes sense to start right there. And um, Newt, given that you were central to the decision to hold that debate and to the decisions that were involved in carrying it out, uh, and for those in our audience who perhaps are not familiar with it, though that's hard for me to imagine, the famous Kennedy-Nixon debate um, particularly went down in history because I think among other things, the visual compact, I'm sorry, the visual impact of it, that Kennedy looked relatively young and chipper. Nixon had a little bit of a five o'clock shadow, chose to wear no makeup, had just been ill. And so the visuals of that debate played quite a role. So Newt, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what organizing that debate taught you about the purpose and impact of these kinds of debates. Were there any surprises or particular lessons that you took away? Television was still fairly new at that time in American history. Um, what, in, what prevented debates on television was the law. The Equal Time Law in the Federal Communications Act requires that if a broadcaster gives or sells time to one candidate, it must do exactly the same with the opponent. Well, there are, believe it or not, this year, 702 candidates for president who are registered with the Federal Elections Commission, 702. It's impossible to have a debate with so many people. So the broadcasters wanted an exemption from the equal time law. Um, Anthony Stevenson, who was my boss and who had been the candidate for president, twice in 52 and 56, was invited to testify about this pending legislation in Congress. And as I, the junior member of the law firm, was assigned to draft his testimony. And we, at Lake, uh, testified in favor of some form of uh, debate or joint discussion and wanted to have an exemption from the law. Congress decided Congress didn't quite trust the broadcasters do this forever, but they said for the 1960 presidential election only, presidential election only, one time, 1960, they would be exempt from the Equal Time Law. That enabled the broadcasters, at that time there were really two and a half networks, ABC was a half a network, NBC and CBS were full networks, they undertook to organize the debates. The first debate took place exactly as you said, 60 years ago today, here in Chicago, where I am, in the television studios of Channel 2, the, the CBS affiliate here, and that's when history was made. Now, the, the visuals of that debate clearly played a key role. And, and maybe I'll open things a little bit broadly here and, and start with, in a sense, the obvious. Um, what does that, what is a debate that it's such a visual component that that's the real power of it. What does that tell people? What does that offer people in learning something about these candidates for president? What, what can they learn about a potential president by watching these debates on TV? Well, I think that the 1960 debates were really key because both Nixon and Kennedy brought very different strategies to how they were thinking about television. And, and I think the debates actually capture that, uh, that they thought about television in tremendously different ways. For example, John Kennedy saw TV as a priority and he pursued a very expensive and very media driven primary campaign to win the nomination. Uh, he appealed very specifically to uh, voters as Jack Kennedy fans. And this is something that I chart in my book is that he 
went on TV and radio and tried to create this flurry of excitement for him as a personality. He transformed himself into a celebrity to gain political legitimacy. And it worked to win the nomination from uh, the, 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 the party's most powerful Democrat in the country, Lyndon Johnson. And so he continues to pursue that that media-driven uh, um, campaign throughout the national or the, the the national or general election as well, and he was his campaign was very much in the red because it was so expensive in the primary. Uh, so he was looking for all sorts of free opportunities to go on news programs and to talk about who he was, his personality, as well as his policies. And so he really sees these debates as an extension of that strategy where he's putting, again, this effort to secure his place on news programs. Uh, and he talks a lot about not just what he stands for, but who he is. He talks a lot about his family. Um, he's really trying to use his personality to connect to, um, to voters. Richard Nixon, on the other hand, saw television a little bit differently. He also took television seriously. And I think that's one thing we frequently get wrong about the 1960 election. We see him as just falling flat, very flat footed in terms of uh, the way he dressed and his makeup and the way he looked on TV. But in many ways, he was thinking about TV as a way he was trying to show that he was qualified, that he didn't need these flashy things that John F. Kennedy was using. And he frequently critiqued uh, Kennedy for being too glitzy and too superficial. So throughout his uh, campaign, he really tried to emphasize that he was the serious candidate and he was using TV to try to do that. And so if you actually look at his um, TV advertisements, they're all fascinating because he's sitting on a desk and speaking to people very seriously about the issues. And, and he brought that mentality that he didn't wanna care about, um, about the way he looked. He, he wanted to, to foreground um, his experience and his credentials as the current vice president. And so I think you see those two different approaches to media politics that shaped the broader campaign actually on display uh, during those debates. Mm -hmm. So beyond that point, I mean, you're, you're talking about two different strategies of people sort of creating a kind of candidate. Um, what other kinds of candidates have people constructed over the years that have been either particularly effective or maybe particularly ineffective? Well, you know, I, I'll, I'll chime in here. I think that, um, one of the things that 1960 unleashes is sort of the performative politics of the presidency. So when you think about 1976, for instance, and Jimmy Carter and Jimmy Carter versus Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter in 76 portrays himself as sort of this plain spoken uh, former peanut farmer um, and not really the sort of seasoned politician and sort of governor of uh, former governor of Georgia that he in fact was. Um, he portrays himself as sort of this honest outsider who's gonna help clean things up in Washington. And that's very, very effective against Gerald Ford, um, even though it's a close election. Um, but one of the reasons why Carter wins is because there's a kind of plain spoken folksiness to Carter that comes out in the debates. This is gonna be in contrast to 1980. By 1980, the country is in a malaise economically, financially, culturally. Uh, Ronald Reagan, who's a former uh, major motion picture actor and a two-term governor of California, um, really, one, um, shows how to perform the presidency when you're not president. When you look at those debates with Reagan and Carter, irrespective of what you might think about Reagan's political policies, his ideological beliefs, he looks as if he's the president of the United States. And Jimmy Carter does not come off in the same way. John Anderson was in, in, in some of those debates, I believe, and Newton would know um, as well. But by, by the time you uh, fast forward a bit to Clinton versus George H.W. Bush, Clinton introduces what we might call presidential aspirational empathy to these debates. Uh, when we think about 92, there's a point where the sitting president, when, when Clinton is answering a question about the economy and different things, um, the sitting president actually looks at his watch. He looks at his watch and he's thinking to himself, his, his body language is, when is this gonna be over? And Clinton, um, at times you can see he radiates empathy, he radiates interest. And I think one of the things Clinton introduces 
that later on presidential candidates like Barack Obama in certain ways are gonna really echo um, and perfect is this idea of attentive listening as a presidential candidate, right? And then finally, when we think about somebody like Barack Obama versus John McCain, Barack Obama versus Mitt Romney. I think one of the things you see in those debates, and this goes back to what Catherine was saying, one of the things that Barack Obama is able to very effectively do, um, and John F. Kennedy had introduced this for, for better or for worse, is create this aura of celebrity around himself. And certainly the, the current president has done it as well, <laughs> um, um, and to, to, to a different effect. But what Barack Obama is able to do in 2008, when you see him debating uh, uh, Senator McCain. And Senator McCain is this towering figure in American politics, this military hero, long-term senator, somebody who a lot of people would feel their integrity is just rock solid. Obama comes off as somebody who is otherworldly, somebody who actually transcends politics, and somebody who we all would sort of imagine in our fever dream could actually be president of the United States, right? And so the performance of being president is what the 1960 debates unleash. And what I would argue, except for 2000, when we know there was a contested election that the Supreme Court um, um, decides, most of the time, the person, whether the person is a sitting president or just the aspirant president, the person who performs as president better, and not performs as president in the sense of, it's like what Catherine said, Nixon was super serious and <laughs> rock solid performs as the president that we all imagine the president to be, okay? And the president of the United States, we always imagine that person to be um, he or hopefully she very soon, somebody who's extra special, somebody who's an outlier, not somebody who can just do the job competently, but somebody who's sort of can do the job heroically. And the person who performs as that potential heroic president is the person who, who wins the elections. Not always, but <laughs> not always, not always, but a lot of times, yes. So we're, we're talking a lot, obviously, here about performance, and we're going to come back to that idea. Um, but Newt, I want to go back to you for a moment here, because um, the Commission on Presidential Debates was established in 1987, and the point of that commission was to ensure these kinds of general election debates for leading candidates as a, a permanent part of the electoral process. So although we're here talking about performance, what was the logic behind creating that, behind making sure that these debates continued? And did you get any pushback against this idea? Well, again, I want to go back a little bit to the law. 1960, the temporary exemption from the equal time law expired. So in order for there to, to be debates in 64, 68, 72, the, the law had to be changed. But the incumbent president, President Johnson in 64, said to leaders in Congress, I don't want to debate, leave the law alone. 1968, um, Nixon was the president. And, and no, it's, it's, no, Johnson was still there. Same thing, he said, no debate. 60, in 72, Nixon was president. He said to Congress, no debate. So the, so the result was no debates in the elections of 64, 68, 72. 76, the Federal Communications Commission decided that Congress was not going to act, that it would act on its own. And it reinterpreted the equal time law to treat debates as an exempt news event, an exempt news event. The League of Women Voters then in 76 organized the 76 debates. Frank Stanton, who had organized the 60 debates, recommended me to help the League, and that's how I got involved. And the League ran the debates in 76, 80, and 84, but they were not getting along with the parties, the candidates. And then we organized the what is currently the Commission on Presidential Debates, which was organized as a result of two studies, one an academic study at Harvard, and the other uh, a study at, um, I think it was Georgetown. 
And that led to the current Commission on Presidential Debates, which has organized every debate, including every one, including the one that will occur next week. Uh, and it's become, I hope, a permanent institution in, in, in American politics. I mean, oh, go ahead, Kath. I was going to say, I think that um, Newt actually mentioned something that's really, I, I would just like to underscore that debates become a part of the political process uh, as it's changing very dramatically in terms of how nominations are won, as we see that shift from an insider party politics determining nominations, shaping so much of the actual campaign to bringing it out more in the open, which means it's more in the, the in television, more driven by the media as well. And so, you know, throughout the 1970s, you have this emergence of a new politics that is supposed to be more transparent, more open to a variety of different people to have their voices uh, shaping the, the conversations, the issues, and who ultimately the nominees will be. And so I think um, in 1976, it's really key um, to, you know, to think about that election as one of the first elections in the wake of Watergate, where there's a push for more information to be out in the public, that push for transparency. Also, again, that, that change in the, the nomination process um, in which you have primary contesters on both sides. And with party bosses no longer um, and party insiders no longer shaping the parameters of the, the conversations about the election, uh, journalists step in to have more of a say. Um, and, and I think that the debates kind of fit into that where journalists really see themselves as giving information that voters need to make their decisions that they're no longer necessarily relying simply on the party for. For sure. Now, we're, uh, this is going to be the greatest understatement in the world. We're in the middle of a distinctive political moment right now. Um, and one of the things that's distinctive about it, you know, we're, we're at a moment that's so polarized that um, it's difficult for people of different views to converse. Um, we're at a moment when we're struggling with the fact that there are facts. Um, so I wonder if any of you would like to comment on the place that um, a debate of this sort is going to have, is there a special place for this kind of a debate in the distinctive kind of a climate that we have right now? Does it you have know, a special power? You know, I would say it does, but I think that in the past debates were less um, about gotcha moments and they were more about a, natu a, a natural conversation where you could, um, people had more of an attentive span, uh, attention span, you know, uh, Newton Minow, uh, the famous uh, television as a vast wasteland <laughs> quote is very instructive here in the age of social media. Uh, people's attention span is unfortunately, uh, we have been trained to have shorter attention spans. And all of us who are scholars know this because we could see it in the new generations of young people who we teach. I've been teaching for over 20 years and our students, the students that I teach um, the attention span is growing shorter and shorter and shorter. Uh, mm -hmm. I used to teach in a context where there was no iPhone. People were ready to sort of engage longer. And I think the national uh, attention span is very, is very short. So I think these debates um, are very, very important. But I think the structures of the debates um, should be transformed from, instead of trying to get many, many questions and allowing uh, uh, folks that only have two minute answers to really have a debate where we say, look, we're just going to talk about education for the entire hour and a half, hour to two hours and a half. We're just going to talk about um, the environment. We're just going to talk about racial justice, gender justice. Um, we're just going to talk about criminal justice reform just for the entire, because what that would do is allow both candidates to say, okay, one, I'm going to get prepared for this one topic, this one topic. But two, we can do a deep dive about what are our philosophical policy differences over these topics, but also tell the American people, what is your vision if you were to be president or remain president about these specific topics? Like again, poverty, LBJ, if you think about, even though like, like Newt said, LBJ said no debates, <laughs> but poverty in the great society. Right now, all these issues are so important and so pressing I think the, the thing that shortchanges the American people in our democracy 
and our, our, our civic standing, our civic health, is that we try to turn a debate into an hour and a half, an hour of gotcha moments between two candidates, right? And so uh, remember the, the famous uh, vice presidential debate with Lloyd Benson and Dan Quayle. And Lloyd Benson got the great line in uh, saying, you know, Senator, I knew Jack Kennedy. I was a friend of Jack Kennedy and you're no Jack Kennedy, you know? Uh, that was a great line, but we lose what, what is the substance of what, of what we're talking about. And what's so important is democracy and democracy right now is imperiled. So I think these debates are still important. Many people are gonna watch these debates, but unfortunately my fear is that partisanship has become so high and so harsh in the country. People are watching to just specifically cheer on their own side, whatever side that might be. And that after the debate, there really is no objective winner or loser because it's only going to be viewed through the prism of partisan politics. With the gotcha moments. Yes. Newt, I wonder what you think about that. About, I mean, and I know that you've spoken in the past and written in the past about uh, the gotcha moment sort of seizing control of things, but, but what's your sense of what this debate might do now and what you hope it would do and what you're afraid that it, it might break down into? Well, you got to start with uh, one fact, and that is that you can't make people debate. We don't have a gun to say, you're going to show up at this time and you're going to participate. This has to be worked out. And what the candidates want are short two minute answers. The debate commission has changed that. And we did it largely because Jim Lehrer, who had been a moderator repeatedly, said, I, he said, we should change the format very much along the line that you're suggesting, except not one subject, but a few said, we have an hour and a half for a debate. And if, if you saw our first debate Tuesday night, the moderator, Chris Wallace, has already announced to the public and to the candidates what the subjects will be in 15 minute segments rather than two minute answers. I would like it myself if it were longer than that. Um, what, we, what we want, you gotta remember, what is the purpose of the debate? The purpose of the debate is not for the candidates, it's for the voters. It's for the voters to learn more about the candidates, what they think, how they think, whether you can trust them, whether you can believe what they say, for you to get an impression directly. You know, going back when I was in school and learned the beginning of democracy, what I understood was that the Greeks thought you couldn't have a democracy with more than 30,000 people. Why 30,000? Because that was a number of people who, who could assemble on a hill in Athens and hear one person speak. Well, what have you got? Now you've got the United States of America with 330 million people scattered across the continent and in Alaska and in Hawaii. But that's the one way that people can hear one person speak at one time and see. So you've got to use this television if we can and radio for people to learn about the candidates. And the purpose of the debates, I keep emphasizing, is not to serve the candidates, but to serve the voter. And that's what we try to do anyway. I think it's really interesting. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, but I think it's really interesting that there's been this tension over whether or not televi televised debates can serve information. Uh, should they be, uh, can they be a reliable source of information for the voters? And, and in fact, this has been something that I have seen debated in every single year that debates have um, actually happened or whether they're being discussed as happening. And throughout 1960, uh, people were disappointed that they didn't get enough out of the, the candidates. They thought that neither of them 
went into more than they did on their campaign speeches. Um, throughout the, the 76 and into the 80s, uh, there is this constant criticism that it was just, you know, these two press conferences that were happening going back and forth. And so I think that this frustration over not getting information um, for the voters has always been there. But on the other hand, I wonder if there's a different way that we can think about the debate. And uh, David Greenberg wrote a really good article about this in 2009, and where uh, he talks about deba debates as this opportunity for civic engagement. And I think that's a really interesting way to see that, yes, you may be cheering on your candidate, um, and you may not really be fully listening to the other side, and there may be that partisan lens that, that comes into how you're understanding that. And I think that's especially perhaps uh, going to happen this year because people are watching it while they're on Twitter. And, and so they're, they're engaging in that spin process immediately. Um, and so I think that that partisan lens may, may shape that experience, but it does bring people together and to talk about the campaign, to talk about their candidates. Um, and it, so it does encourage um, civic rituals. Um, and so I think that could be something uh, that, again, th there might be problems with that in terms of relying on this as the sole way people get the information, but it does help people engage in the political process. So it, it creates a we, but it might be a really argumentative <laughs> fraught we, but still, it, it's going to fuel a conversation, and, and that needs to happen for a functioning democracy. Hmm. And I think that, you know, again, I'm trying to be, have a, po a positive um, attitude about this, uh, but I, I do think that these, these debates could help at this particular moment because uh, the candidates are not interacting with one another, uh, and they're really because of COVID-19, there's so much um, at being used in terms of advertisements that are pre-packaged, um, that are, you know, very carefully crafted and vetted uh, before they're, 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 they go out there to the broader public. And so this might be an opportunity for people to get out of those different echo chambers, um, actually see the other candidates interact. And, um, and again, it's a brief, brief hour and a half uh, where people are all actually watching the same thing. Um, and I do think, uh, again, those partisan filters um, might really undermine uh, the potential here, but there is that potential. Yeah, you know, I, I would say, unfortunately, no, I would disagree. Um, because I think right now, for those of us who are uh, observing what's happening um, out in the streets of America and, and protests and what's happening in terms of our government as well, and just um, the, the, the lies and the myths um, the, and the, the obfuscations, uh, we are in a transformative moment. And this debate is not going to bring the nation closer together, no. Um, um, what we can hope for is in the future um, that we try to set up uh, institutions that strengthen our democracy, that strengthen our civic culture, but right now, uh, we are in um, very, very uh, harsh times, and this debate, if anything, is going to amplify, uh, unfortunately, people's pre-existing echo chambers. I mean, because we, we, and we see this in the data too, the, the, the data about these different hardcore issues, and just even the fact that we're going to have one of the topics be about cities and violence, these are all, these aren't even dog whistles anymore. These are open whistles, you know, that are, this isn't about racial codes. We've evolved from Nixon in 68 to 2020, where we are open with our racial division and our racial strife. And it's, it's very impactful vis-a-vis -a, -vis a portion of the electorate that is very, very vulnerable to these messages and wants to hear messages about racism and division and a portion of the electorate that is reaching towards um, what we're now calling anti-racism, uh, social justice in a, in a big way. So I definitely think if we see, and we all know this just from the discourse of television and cable news, um, Twitter, Instagram, we are living in two different nations, a divided society. And those two different nations in certain ways are as divided as they were on the eve and just after the civil war. And I don't think this debate, the way it's set up, um, and the two candidates that we have, 
uh, are, are somehow going to be able to bridge that divide. If anything, this is going to amplify the divisions, the pre-existing divisions that we have. Will that continue in the future? Not necessarily. We can make a different future. We can choose a different future. But right now, we are all too fixed in this moment on those um, ideological poles that got us to this moment to somehow utilize Tuesday night in the subsequent debates to unravel, untie that Gordian knot, that disagreement over what does citizenship mean? What does American identity mean, right? What does it mean to be an American in 2020? And the pandemic, this year, 2020 is a year of plague. It's a year of upset. It's a year of protest, but it's also a year of opportunity. This provides us all with different competing visions of reality. Some of us interpret the pandemic differently. Some of us think it's a hoax. Others really think and believe in science. Some of us interpret these protests as a beautiful reimagining of American democracy. Others interpret these protests as um, the fall of civil society. There's no way these debates can get those two competing uh, uh, visions um, together. The, the hope though, is that in the aftermath of this debate that maybe 2020 is a fever and a fever uh, has to break. And once that fever breaks, um, a, kind of, um, a kind of empathy between both sides can come um, and, and, and force us all to strengthen these institutions, to rethink and reimagine these institutions, but to strengthen these institutions um, um, of American democracy that we, we all, not all of us, but some of us hold so dear. So just to clear, I mean, those are really excellent points. And I absolutely agree with you. And I just want to emphasize that I don't think that a debate is going to solve all of this. Um, but but do, don't you think any, is, is, it, is it productive to have two candidates who talk at each other and, um, and their, their, their audiences um, are hearing such different things? Do you think it be, could be productive to have them actually again, whether or not they are debating, uh, but to, to exchange um, different narratives, to, call, to try to call one another out on the blatant misinformation that of course the president frequently tries to advance on some of these issues, at least having um, people of all different political stripes see an effort to uncover that and to call that out and to call that into question. Do you think there, there's a productive opportunity for that? Oh, no, I think, I think, yes, we have to have these debates. This is part of the functioning of democracy. My, my fear is that in this year of 2020 and racial and political reckoning, we're gonna have two candidates who, who talk past each other. And, and, and what that does to sides, because really we're in, a, we're in an extraordinary moment in American history because in the past we've had candidates who disliked each other. We had candidates who had sharp ideological divides with each other. But in a, in, a, in, a, in a cohesive way, we had candidates who agreed on the political reality of the present, right? That, that there, was a, there was an objective political reality that they interpreted differently, but they could agree on that political reality. I think that what we're seeing now is that we can't even agree on the political reality. We have a president who's saying, look, he gets an A plus for the handling of the pandemic. And we have tens of millions of Americans who agree with that. Where I think in the past, we could have, we could have had more people agree objectively, no, the pandemic, irrespective of ideology, has not been um, effectively handled by the federal government and by this president. Um, but the very fact that you have that means that we have these competing realities. And unfortunately, right now we've doubled down on what we believe, both sides, right? Have doubled down on what, what they believe. And what that has produced is produced um, some of the most divisive uh, political rhetoric uh, in American history that goes back to the Civil War and Reconstruction, but it's also produced a real anger and mourning on both sides of the ideological aisle, on both sides. So sometimes there was a great book by Arlie Hochschild, Anger and Mourning on the American Right. I'll tell you, in the context of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, in the context of 2020, there is anger and mourning throughout America on the American right and the American left. And these two candidates speaking past each other and really being angry at each other <laughs> passionately and not, not empathizing with each other. Although I would argue that one candidate has shown more empathy than the, than the other. 
that really continues to amplify our division. But as a matter of muscle memory, should we have these debates? Absolutely. The more uh, things that we can do to help our democracy flourish, the more we should be doing those things. That's what I, I wanted to go ahead, Newt, and ask you to, to weigh in since we've got two different views here. <laughs> well, my hunch is, and I want to deal with what one issue, and that's the pandemic. Uh, I think the most important thing that may come out of Tuesday or the, the series of debates is how different views are to deal with the pandemic. Um, there's a very sharp division, as you point out, as both of you point out, uh, in, in this country uh, on many issues, but particularly on that. And what I think the debate will do, the debate, de debates will do, will show the American people how the two candidates deal and propose to deal today and in the future in the next term with the pandemic. And there are very, going to be very, very different views. And I think that that's the, that's the best part of the debate is that we will see and hear the candidates together dealing with the same issue. Most of the time you deal with the commercials, with the amount of money being spent on politics, there really isn't very much that's uh, available to you to in depth. And I'm hoping that what we'll see uh, uh, in the pandemic is in depth discussion of what should be done in the eyes of both candidates. So That's what in, I would urge everybody to watch for uh, Tuesday. So in the spontaneity um, that, that Katie is talking about, you're suggesting, Newt, that even if we live in the world that Peniel just described where we just bang up against each other, in, in that banging process, that spontaneity will potentially tell us something about the moment that we're in, I suppose about the pandemic, that the clashing in and of itself um, will be important and educational, even if people don't come away transformed as to whatever side that they're on. Well, either you believe in science or you don't. That it's would be true. <laughs> proposition. Uh, and, and I think this is gonna clarify that. That would be good. I, <laughs> I would applaud that. Um, let me ask you all one more question and then I wanna segue into uh, questions coming from the audience. Um, given that you're all, um, scholars of these debates in one way or another, what would you tell people watching these debates to watch for? If you could, if you could speak to the audience of these debates, what would you say to them uh, as audience members to prepare them for watching it or, or what they ought to watch for that might help them evaluate what's going on? Hmm. So I think one thing, uh, there are a lot of things I could uh, imagine, but I think one thing to be aware of um, is the, the power of spin that is going to be happening right away. Uh, this is something that you really see coming out uh, for the first time of the 1976 election uh, is where, you know, Jimmy Carter's team is very actively taking advantage of, you know, one of Ford's gaffes, the, the, uh, the statement he made about Eastern Europe and Poland. Um, and uh, or Eastern Europe being under the domination of um, the Soviet Union. And, and you could see right after that moment, uh, Carter's team really capitalizes on that um, and then tries to turn that into an issue of the campaign. Um, and really, again, uh, his, his team is working with journalists to raise their attention about this is a major mistake and this reflects these broader things. And from that point on, you see this idea of the spin team uh, really shaping everything that's happening immediately after the debate. And I think now we're gonna see that happening in real time. And I think what's really key is to understand that. Uh, so, and not to, to, again, just to be have more media literacy, to understand you know, who is shaping interpretations of what's coming out um, and why. And I would encourage people to develop their own opinions, but I do understand that there, uh, there are going to be so many voices interpreting um, that this is a win for Biden, this is a win for Trump, um, and to try to be aware of that, but to tune it out as much as possible because that is very much um, 
an integral part of the debate. It's not just the debate, it's how the debate shapes the media narrative moving forward. And so I think being aware of that would make people um, more media savvy consumers and citizens um, as they're watching this information happen. Yeah, you know, I would say that people should be on the lookout for whose um, vision of our current political reality um, is closer to their perspective objectively away from their, their ideological perspective. Um, so the debate should really be about what is the current health of American democracy and America's place um, in the wider world. Obviously, this has been this huge year of pandemic, of protest, of, of unrest, but also opportunity. So I'd say that the thing to watch out for is to look for, um, one, to look for truth, who's, who's consistent, um, who's, who's speaking to uh, the tenor of the times, um, and who's empathetic, who's speaking to, we've got tens of millions of Americans who are out of work, who are hurting. We've got 37 million Americans who have um, food insecurity and are hungry. Uh, we've got millions of Americans um, who are homeless. We've got over 200,000 who died from the COVID-19 pandemic. So we, we have these real, real challenges. And I think that the thing to watch for is to see which of the candidates is gonna to try to confront those challenges in, a, in an honest way, in an open way, in a sober way, and has a vision to try to bring the country together. Because I do think that when Barack Obama spoke in 2004 at the Democratic National Convention, and really had this unifying call uh, for, for a kind of civic nationalism uh, based on empathy. I think that was a powerful call, even as there were some real challenges and obstacles that rhetorically he sort of flew over, which politicians tend to do. <laughs> they tend to sort of call us to this meeting place, uh, like Newton was saying in, in, you know, in, in Athens, you know, we're gonna call us to that, that big uh, city on, on a shining hill, but there are many, many obstacles to get there, right? Um, but think of what candidate has a potentially, because again, we are not right now in a nationally unifying moment, but we also have to think and not our, allow our, our imaginations to be held hostage by this moment. What candidate has the best opportunity to move the country forward in a unifying vision? Doesn't mean you're gonna agree with the candidate in every single aspect of their policy, but it means that you think that this candidate has more empathy, more understanding, um, and is speaking more honestly about this moment because so much of this moment is based on um, lies uh, that we've told about the country, that we've told about ourselves, that we've told about justice, that have suddenly come uh, to the fore for the entire world to see, including us. We shouldn't shrink away from this moment. We should try to see how can this moment make us all better by honestly assessing how did we get here and what can we do to move out of this moment together? Well, I, I agree with all of that. I think what you really want to see if you can is how the candidate thinks. What kind of a mind does a candidate have and how does he or her use it? The other thing you want to know is, is this a candidate I can trust? Can I believe what he or she says? Uh, that, that, that's, I think, what issues come and go, issues change. But you want to know if the person has the ability, the judgment, uh, the mind to deal with changing circumstances and to adapt policy as needed, uh, particularly when you're living at a time as we are of uh, nuclear danger, of uh, terrible uh, pandemics. You want to know, is this a person who can command my trust and who I believe will reach a wise, fair decision? That's what you want to try to get out of the debate, I think. Thank you. Um, we're going to segue from, from that advice uh, to open things up uh, to questions from the audience. Um, please use the Q&A function to submit your questions. AHA staff are managing incoming questions. They'll dismiss questions if they've already been answered or if they're not appropriate. Um, for those who are watching this through Facebook Live, uh, please use the comment section to submit questions and AHA staff will pass them along as well. We're gonna try to answer as many questions as we can 
uh, during the time that's remaining. So send along your questions. Um, and I'll start right now with uh, some of the questions we've already gotten. Um, and this actually, it's a good place to start because we've been so focused on the presidency, we didn't really talk about vice presidential debates. Clearly they've evolved along with presidential debates. How much importance do vice presidential debates really bring generally and very specifically in this election? You know, I'll say very quickly in terms of the VP debate, I think people, the VP ever since Lyndon Johnson can only hurt you and not help you. I think that Lyndon Johnson, uh, who lived uh, in my, my state current, currently where I reside in Texas, Austin, um, and obviously Johnson City, um, Lyndon Johnson, without Lyndon Johnson, Jack Kennedy could not have won uh, the presidency in 1960. Since then, what you see with vice presidential debates um, Dan Quayle um, hurt uh, George H.W. Bush. It wasn't enough to lose the presidency, but I think that if um, the Dukakis campaign had run a more robust campaign, they might have actually um, won and been able to utilize Quayle against that, that campaign in a bigger way. Um, I think Al Gore helped uh, Clinton less within the context of the debates but more that Clinton was 44 and Al Gore was, Clinton was 46, Al Gore was 44, and it became a youthful ticket, the Gore-Clinton ticket, the Clinton-Gore ticket, where they took the bus trip around the country in 1992, showed a kind of, a kind of youth. I think Joe Biden helped Barack Obama. I think Biden uh, provided a kind of seasoning for people, uh, people to see that Barack Obama was 46, 47, but he had Joe Biden who, had been this um, sort of foreign policy um, expert and had been in the Senate since 1973. Uh, so I think the vice president can hurt you more than they can help you. And what most candidates are looking for is a vice president who's really gonna be a pit bull, a vice president who's gonna do the kind of attack and say the kind of things that the president, um, she or he would not wanna say uh, in a debate. Um, so that's what I think about the VP. So the VP is not somebody who can really, really um, help you win states, but they can, they can help you excite your campaign. So Kamala Harris, I think, is a very, very helpful VP. Um, she's the first Black woman, South Asian woman on a major party ticket in American history. But I also think that she's a former prosecutor. She's unbelievably intelligent, like Newton Minow talked about, check the mind. Um, of the person. And I think she's a very, very effective debater. She's very, very um, eloquent and very, very elegant in her speech. So I think that when you think about the VP, you always think about somebody who will first do no harm. And we remember 1972 and George McGovern and Thomas Eagleton to Sergeant Shriver and Thomas Eagleton um, and that debacle who had, who, 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 who had some, some issues for that time um, and and in, in the treatment of depression, which we now take seriously as as a mental as a mental illness, as emotional illness that we that can and should be treated and should not exclude people, but um, you don't want to do that. You don't want to have a VP who somehow something comes out and people say that this VP is disqualified. And the last thing I'll say on that, one of the interesting things in 2008, Hillary Clinton had made a rhetorical tactical mistake in that very close primary run with Barack Obama, because very early on the Clinton campaign said he couldn't satisfy the 3 a.m. litmus test. But as that contest became closer, there were people in the Clinton camp who said, well, what about you getting both candidates, Clinton, but Clinton on top and Obama on the bottom? The Obama campaign responded saying, well, she said that we weren't ready for the 3 a.m. call. So how can we actually even be on the ticket together? Because she's saying he's not qualified for that 3 a.m. call. So sometimes you, you, can, you, can, uh, you can attack somebody who later on you just want to actually team up with. And we saw that in 2008. I always thought that was one of the most remarkable parts of the, the campaign that, that people didn't discuss. Yeah. Katie or Newton, do you want to say anything about the vice presidential uh, component in these debates? Well, in the first, in the 60 debate, there was no vice presidential um, debate. And subsequently, when the league uh, revived the debates in 76, and subsequently, we've always had a vice presidential debate, which I think is important because 
the voter ought to know uh, uh, what the vice president would be like in case of the call upon to become president. So uh, uh, we have one vice presidential debate and three presidential debates, which I think is probably the correct uh, balance, but it gives the voter a chance to know uh, and evaluate uh, the running mate, uh, bearing in mind the possibility that that person could become the president. Yeah, I just finished reading a great book on the 1976 election uh, by Daniel Willem Williams, and he makes the argument in there that you know Carter or, or Mondale did in the, that first vice presidential debate performed very well. Uh, Dole came off very aggressive, as Penny was talking about. That tends to be the strategy, uh, th that attack strategy. But he handled it so well uh, that uh, the Carter campaign actually started to elevate um, him in. Their, their, their national cam, elevate his presence, have him talk more on the campaign trail because he did uh, handle that debate so well and really did connect with a particular demographic of voters. And so I think that really um, underscores uh, the, 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 the points that you were talking about in terms of there is a tendency to be aggressive, um, but there is an opportunity there um, to, to show your qualifications for the office and how you would handle, um, how you handle the spotlight. Okay, we're gonna move on here to another, a, a pandemic related question here. Um, obviously we've seen how the pandemic really transformed the production of the Democratic and Republican conventions. I have to say, I'm always fascinated at the, the mixing of technology and democracy. So watching that kind of technological improvisation, I found really fascinating. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do you anticipate the debates being changed or impacted by the pandemic? You know, I, I would say that the, the, the pandemic, oh, N Newton, are you? Well, I'm just gonna say we, the debate commission has had to change things drastically. Uh, our first two debates were gonna be at two universities, Notre Dame and Michigan, both decided, I think quite correctly, that they didn't wanna have a large crowd there with the pandemic. So we've had to adapt uh, to uh, a, a uh, what we think is a safe, healthy process. And, uh, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Uh, but, but the uh, the, the main, main point I want to make is the primary debates have audiences which cheer and interrupt and do commercials. The presidential debates has no audience that says anything or cheers or boos. We do not have commercials. Uh, and there's a big difference. The primary debates, I think, are in many ways uh, run by broadcasters who want to promote their own people and um, less involved with what, what we think is a pure voter-oriented uh, purpose. And um, I, I want to make that point because people confuse the presidential debates with the vice presidential debates all the time. You know, I was going to say that I think the biggest thing that not having an audience um, is going to amplify is just the pandemic and the idea that the federal government's response and the White House's response has not been competent. It's not been effective. It's been a pretty cruel and gruesome response. And the very fact that if we might, if we, if we have competent leadership, will we be able to not resume um, a normalcy? Because I don't think America is ever going to get back to the old normal. I think we're in a process trying to build a new consensus. But that we could be safe, that we could be safe, that we could maybe resume contact with each other. Um, so I think the very fact that right now, uh, you know, we, we, we have some sports teams playing in bubbles or with very, very uh, limited capacity or with no fans at all, really speaks to this crisis of um, leadership that the country is facing. So I think that, that the, 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 the debate format, as did the um, conventions, really reflects these dire times that we're in. And I think it gives voters another chance to assess that idea of honesty and how the mind of the candidates work 
um, just because this predicament that we're in, the science at least has told us we didn't have to be in this exact predicament, uh, but, but we are in that predicament. And so the very fact that there's gonna be this very unusual debates, but three of them um, starting Tuesday, to me, it just amplifies how dire a situation our democracy is in. And I think millions of people, the tens of millions who watch that debate, hopefully, I hope this debate has these debates have the biggest um, audience in American history, and not just because of, of we, we, we have Newton here, um, and not just because of ratings and advertising, but for our democracy. But those of us who truly believe in democracy, we want as many people to be part of this experience as possible, as many people to vote as possible, as many people to be active citizens as possible. So I hope everyone watches these debates who can, uh, but I think that I hope they understand why the debates are formatted the way they are vis-a-vis -vis this COVID-19 pandemic, um, we might have had an alternate reality if we had competent leadership. Okay. Um, another question, actually not unrelated, we're segueing a little bit to journalists here. Um, what do you think about the position of journalists in the debate process as it's developed and Key question here, what should the role of the moderator be? Who would like to weigh in? I think that's such a fascinating question. And because I think a lot, um, especially right now, uh, so many responsibilities are put on the moderators. There's a lot of discussion um, about, you know, the moderator is serving as fact checking and, you know, making sure that they follow up uh, with concrete questions, uh, calling out uh, the, the different candidates uh, when they do lie about certain things, when they, they manipulate the different realities that we've talked about. So I think that the challenge for moderators um, I, is, is tremendous. And uh, and I think that moderators, uh, you know, again, just looking at this historically, they have tended to uh, originally, um, and again, uh, Newt can add in here because he's been more involved in this process, but from what I've seen is that, you know, they, they tried to just really enforce the rules, that they had certain questions that they, uh, they were prepared to ask, and they tried very hard to, you know, keep people on their time limits. And, um, and then I think it's just more recently uh, that they've weighed in and trying to ask some more specific follow-up questions um, and in trying to make sure that people actually answer the questions, but it's a, it's a, it's a challenge in that capacity. But I think that they've become a lot more involved, uh, more expectations are on moderators today than there were in the past. Hmm. You know, I, I would say that the moderator, and this is suggested here saying that should the moderator be a historian or one of the moderators, I would say yes, you know, and I think- um, Not biased at all. <laughs> well, you know, I think, I think what's interesting about a historian, and um, when we think about the, uh, how many um, voters we have in this country and women voters, um, a, a female historian would be great. Um, a, a, woman of, a woman of color uh, would be awesome too, that, that was at every debate. I think a historian would be important and historian of not just presidential history, but social, political um, history, cultural history as well, that could keep candidates honest. Because I think sometimes journalists are overwhelmed um, with trying to keep everything in line. It's like Catherine was saying, you can't just be, you're, you're trying to keep the logistics of the time in line. Uh, maybe lies or half-truths get, get, um, uh, get dismissed. And I think one of the things that the current, our current reality shows us is that it's, it's surprisingly easy to defy democratic norms. I think the last four years have shown us that, that there were, there were um, uh, to, to, to quote uh, when, when John Roberts, Justice Roberts says he's an umpire, he just calls balls and strikes, right? Um, uh, moderators have to do more than just call balls and strikes, but what, and Newton knows this, in the past, when you think about Jack Kennedy and Richard Nixon, or we flash forward to 76, um, all the way up until 2016 and 2020, you had um, candidates who walked the fine line of accepted behavior at debates, but within the political uh, structures that we have. What we've seen over the last four years, and when you think about the Senate and the Congress, we've seen this over decades, is norms have been defied 
And journalists don't know how to respond to norms that are being defied. They really don't. Um, some, some journalists have responded, but it's also, it's also head turning because what do you do if you have a president who's lying repeatedly and consistently during a presidential debate? Do you, do you say, Mr. President, <laughs> you're lying? What do you, so it's very, very uncomfortable. So I think that we need a new kind of perspective uh, for moderators uh, where it's not just sort of calling balls and strikes, it's really holding whatever candidate, this is away from ideology, um, accountable for their misstatements and half-truths. For, for um, the sitting president might be one thing, for um, uh, candidate, uh, by, for, former Vice President Biden, it could, be, it could be another, it could be a series of votes that he did in the Senate that you have to hold him accountable for as well. So I do think that we, we, we are in a very, we, a historian would be great alongside of a journalist. If journalism is the rough draft of history, what we do as historians is we clean up the mess, right? And we clean it up by going to archives and dedicating our lives to cleaning up the mess that's not based on partisanship. We actually, we actually call them as we see them. We call out um, um, people who are from blue states and we call out people who are from red states. We call out people in power and we call out poor people too because we follow the evidence. And it would be great to have a moderator who has been used to doing that their whole lives. And that moderator should be somebody who's ethical enough to call out even somebody who in other instances they might agree, agree with. Historians call out things, but they call them out later. They don't call them out the same time as they debate. Uh, one of the most uh, valuable things the Commission on Debates does is work with other countries. Uh, we work with some 80 different countries, all with different levels of, dem of a democratic process to organize debates in those countries. It's interesting to get the perspective of others because they don't all use journalists as the moderators. They have different kinds of moderators. Uh, Teddy White once proposed when we were first beginning that the debate ought to be conducted in the halls of Congress and that the leaders of the opposition party should be the questioner. Uh, other people say they should be historians. Other people say they should be uh, business people, teachers, they should be uh, a more diverse group. We call them, we have a very diverse group of moderators. But in any event, it, it doesn't have to be journalists. The history, uh, and I'm a great believer, I would have loved to have been a historian myself. Why do we have journalists as, as moderators now? It's because the broadcasters started the first debate and used their own people. Second, the candidates want journalists. The candidates themselves want journalists. Uh, and so it, I, I think in the future, you will not see all journalists as debates evolve in the future. Okay, let's um, back away here for a little bit more of a general question about um, the impact of the debates. Uh, this person is asking, how much of an influence do debates have on the outcome? And related to that, do major gaffes significantly affect the final result of an election? So I have a very strong opinion about this, <laughs> so I can start, uh, because I thought a lot about this, because I've studied the 1960 election, I've studied TV, and you know there is a popular memory of the 1960 election that the TV debate uh, that's why, you know, Kennedy won the election. And I would argue that that is a myth. And, you know, many scholar historians, um, political historians, media historians have documented, um, uh, have pierced holes in that myth. Um, and so there are a variety of different um, ways in which they've shown, you know, the, the, that survey, right, that's frequently um, cited that those people who listen to Nixon thought he won on radio, where those people who watch Kennedy on TV thought he won. And that's supposed to show this, uh, the, the role that image and TV played. Well, again, that's a, it's a really, it's based on anecdotes, not on real research. And historians have shown how, um, how that is a myth of the, the, the 1960 debates and their impact. However, what I think is really key here is that those ideas, those conversations about how, um, 
how much of a difference a TV debate can make um, it can really then reshape political practices and our very ideas of what is required and what is needed uh, to run for office. And you really see this with the 1960 election because nobody believed more uh, that TV and the TV debates in particular um, determined the outcome more than Richard Nixon. He firmly believed this. Uh, and, and again, historians have shown that there are many other reasons why he lost the 1960 election. Uh, but he believed it was because of these television debates and because of his media strategy. And that transformed how he thought about campaigning, how he thought about political power. And he really then begins to emulate everything that he saw Kennedy do that he criticized during the actual 1960 election. He really makes media the priority and, and in ways that he saw Kennedy do in 1960. And so the TV debates are at the core of how he thinks of this. And um, all of the, the, the archives talking about his media strategy, the documents show that he's obsessed with the 1960 debates. Um, and it really does change the way that he thinks about politics. And then when he ultimately wins the 1968 election, that then it lets a lot of people, he's saying, this is what I did differently. And, and then they start to believe in the power of media and television in particular. So I think that it has, these debates can really um, reshape norms, um, reshape um, cultural values, but not because of the, the debates themselves, but the way that they're talked about and the way that they're remembered. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would say that um, debates can shape narratives and media narratives. And I'll go back to 2012 and give, give an anecdote. So Barack Obama, Mitt Romney. After the first Obama-Romney debate, many people argued that Obama had lost that debate. They said that Obama was listless. Uh, he seemed tired. He seemed like he didn't want to be there. Um, some people in Obama's own camp said they felt the same way. There was a media narrative, both in the mainstream press and the African-American press, which I follow both very, very closely, that was saying Obama had lost the debate and in so doing might actually lose his reelection campaign. Um, and what you saw is one, um, after a while, even though initially Obama said he thought he had won the debate, he actually conceded to this new reality, this narrative, and said, you know what, I lost that debate. But he promised his own people that he was going to be much better prepared for debates two and three. And what most people felt was that by debate number two, Obama was back to the, to the person people had expected him to be. He was back to his 2008 self. He was, he was that, that star that people needed, that his own supporters wanted him to be. Obviously, Obama goes on to win um, 29 states and win re-election. He only lost the two states he loses between 2008 and 2012 are, are North Carolina and Indiana. So he goes from 31 states in the District of Columbia to 29 states in the District of Columbia. So what's interesting for me about that is this. No matter what a political scientist might say, and I love political scientists, I read them and my colleagues, no matter what the data and the, the, the exit voter data might say, what's important about debates is this. They shape popular narratives that go beyond mainstream corporate media, now are connected to social media and connected to different constituent groups that are vital, including GOTV efforts, get out the vote efforts, that are vital to a candidate's success or failure. So one of the things that people have to understand is that irrespective of whether you, the candidate, feel you won or lost a debate, Post-debate, you have to set up, whether that means you manufacture it <laughs> or whether it's an objective reality, you have to set up an echo chamber among likely voters for you that insist you won the debate, that insist you won the debate so they think they can go to the polls feeling confident and prideful that their person, she or he, has won the debate and is going to win the, win the, win the office. Now, People might later say, look, Obama was going to win no matter what that narrative of the, deba the debates um, said, because when you look at it, he wins 29 states. Um, he wins handily in Ohio. He wins Florida. He wins all these key states. But I would argue that the narrative of the loss, if that loss had been sustained through three straight debates with Mitt Romney, 
that the outcome might have been different. The outcome might have been different because what happened in debates two or three actually influenced his own voters. It influenced them. They didn't want to be connected with somebody who was listless and not performing. They wanted to be connected with the, with the dreams of 2008. And he performed um, very effectively in debates two and three. And people conceded that um, their, their guy had gotten his magic back. I, I remember headlines that said after the second debate, the president has his mojo back. The president had lost his mojo against Mitt Romney, but he got it back. And I think that that was very, very important um, um, for his success and his successful reelection. Almost all the studies I've seen indicate that most people have made up their minds on who they're gonna vote for before the debate. Yeah. And by most, I mean something like 85%. There may be, let's say there are 15% who are undecided. Their vote can be influenced by the debates, but I think it's a very small percentage. Most of the time, the debates reinforce the view that the voter had before the debate. And for the small number uh, that exists, I doubt that they decide the election. Mm. Uh, here's another... Um moderator related question. Um, how would each panelist advise the moderators? Is there a question that you would pose or a strategy that you might use to get the candidates off of their prepared policy scripts? Well, I would, I would ask every candidate, why do you wanna be president? Why are you worthy of the highest office in the land? Um, what is driving you? What is your passion to either maintain the presidency or become president, right? Um, and I, I'd be very, very attentively listening for answers that go beyond ego and go beyond pride and go beyond wanting to win. Um, and, and that really talk about the people um, that talk about both the grandeur and the travails of American democracy, but that really give me a sense of somebody who's going to be a service oriented and a servant oriented leader, because that's what you want from the presidency. So I would ask them, why do you want to be president? And if it's the president, I'd say, why do you want to and why do you deserve four more years? I would actually agree with that very much so. And, and I think that because kind of getting into the nitty gritty of the issues, it's just not possible in 15 minutes to talk about education, um, as, as Penny was talking about earlier. So I think that, you know, really seeing these for what they, what they do do, and they offer an opportunity to push both of the candidates on this question of values and vision. And, um, and I think that that was really important to call out and have a, conver a very specific conversation about that as well. Uh, I agree with that. And I'd also add, who are the presidents that you would like to be like? Uh, who would you, uh, if you could be listed as being like President X, who would, that, who would President X be? That's I love a great that question. question. <laughs> Newton, that's a great question. And when we hear, if one of the candidates answers Jefferson Davis, it's going to tell us a lot. About <laughs> it's going to tell us a lot about that candidate. <laughs> if a candidate says they love Jefferson Davis, and if a candidate says they love Robert E. Lee, it tells us a lot about that candidate. It tells us a lot about that candidate, Newton. <laughs> uh, OK, here's a question. Uh, someone wondering. Can anyone say something about non-televised presidential debates, debates that preceded the ones that we've been talking about? Well, I would actually like you to talk about that, uh, Joanne. Is there any way that you could talk about the debates, um, the, the Lincoln-Douglas debates? I think so many people think of that um, in terms of setting that, that structure and that idea about discourse and conversation. and. Um, and meaningful substantive conversation. Is that actually what happened? Mm -hmm. Newton, you want to weigh in on, on oh. Douglas or? Well, the Lincoln Douglas debate uh, had no sponsor. <laughs> Lincoln Douglas uh, negotiated that debate directly with each other, and it was all done in a, two letters. 
so from the role of the sponsor, it was non-existent. Mm -hmm. From the role of the um, voter, uh, it was much, much more information that we get in our current debates. These were long debates. Uh, the, uh, they were not questions from journalists. These were classical debates where, where, the, where the, the, there was a proposition, who should be elected? And the, the uh, uh, reading, reading the literature of the debates, uh, and Joanne can tell us more, there was a real substance there. Uh, the, the issue was not, as I understand, the issue was not slavery. Am I right? Well, it was an issue, but it wasn't. At, and during the debates, it was not the issue. Not an issue. Yeah. yeah. It, so the debate versus the reality, once again, is something to, <laughs> to think about in that election as in many others. Um, we are at the last question here. And here it is. How do you anticipate presidential debates changing in the future? How should they change? And how will they? You know, I'd say in the future, it's like what we've all said. I think that there should be a much more diverse group of moderators, including um, college students, including people who are poor, moderators who are non-able-bodied, uh, non-cisgender, queer moderators, uh, Black women, Latinx women, um, moderators from all walks of life uh, should be should be part of it. And I think that what we said too, if it's a 90 minute debate, we should just have th at least three three issues in 30 minute blocks instead of 15 minutes where we can hear a vision for American democracy and American society and a future forward vision about education, about mass incarceration, even about civics and, 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 and democracy itself. So I think um, that should be a, a, a big change. And then finally, I'd say where we hold the debates matter. I think we should have debates, not just at universities, but we should have debates that are in union halls. We should have debates that are uh, uh, in, in open parks and public spaces. We should have debates that are reflecting the topography, topography and the geography of the United States, um, including places they've never ever uh, been before. You know, uh, public schools that are uh, African American, that are Latinx, uh, that are indigenous, right? So we, we need to think about that too, and not just have them um, at a university, prestigious university, or a strategically lo located Southern university. We need to think about where they're gonna debate, how they're gonna debate, and we want moderators that reflect the vast diversity um, economically, racially, religiously, right, um, uh, of, of, the, of, the, um, of the country. Other thoughts on, on how things might change in the future or how they should change in the future? Go ahead, Katie. Okay, um, go ahead. I'm, I'm very curious as to your thoughts, Newt, because you have seen these changes and you've been a part of them. And, you know, I, I absolutely agree with some of the, the ideas that uh, P. Neil was talking about. And um, uh, I just I'm really curious as to how those ideas would face off against the, the, the demands of the debates in terms of the cost, the security, all of those institutional demands that have made them Kind of take shape the way that they have. How can you um, how can you try to grapple with those those concrete issues uh, versus kind of the demand for new voices and perspectives and places? Well, I think they will change uh, enormously in the future. Uh, I would like to, having been a college debater myself uh, at Northwestern University, which wins more debate awards than any other university in the country. Uh, I would love to see one that was a classical uh, form of debate. Uh, and uh, I'd like to see others, uh, as Neil has suggested, uh, and as Katie has suggested. But I think the important point is that debates don't cost the candidates anything. They don't have to raise money for it. Uh, it's taken money out of politics and they reach everybody and it's 
I, I think the important thing is one thing. They're for the voter, not for the candidates. Well, let me take this opportunity then to close things here by thanking all of you for taking part, for sharing your wisdom with us this afternoon, for doing so much to prime the people who have been watching uh, to really be ready for watching these debates as they come along in the next weeks. Uh, those of you who have been tuning in and watching, thank you for being here. Uh, this is the kind of public forum that really feeds the democratic process. So uh, thank you for being part of that. Uh, thanks as well to the American Historical Association for really supporting this kind of forum and feeding into the democratic process and for reminding us that everything has a history, including presidential debates. And then last but not least, I do wanna remind everybody to vote. Now, as far as tuning in for this, um, we encourage you all to stay up to date with the virtual AHA, uh, HTTPS, backslash www.historians.org backslash virtual dash AHA. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AHA YouTube channel in the new week. And it's also going to be accessible on AHA's Facebook Live page. So feel free if you wanna watch it again or tell your friends or other folks to catch up on it, please do. And uh, as I said before, more than anything else, vote. Thank you. <laughs>